Hey friends, my name's Georgie. Such a warm welcome to the Just Breathe podcast where I'll be talking all things breathing to help empower you guys to use the power of your breath to harness your bodies and minds. Today's episode is a collection of the highlights from episode 10 of the podcast with Patrick McEwen. It was such a powerful conversation. I wanted to bring back the best bits. Patrick McEwen is an international best-selling author of both The Oxygen Advantage and The Breathing Cure, as well as the creator of The Oxygen Advantage Technique. Patrick's mission is to empower people to take control of their own health, well-being and fitness using simple breathing exercises proven to improve body oxygenation. Patrick was a huge part of my personal journey with the breath and we got chatting about breathing in children and the importance of functional breathing from an early age, social media, as well as the three key elements of breathing and why they are so foundational to optimizing your health. I really hope you enjoy the parts of the episode I've picked out and walk away feeling inspired to tap into the power of your breath. A little bit of housekeeping, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the Just Breathe podcast. Let's keep on building that strong breathing community. The more people talking about the power of the breath, the better. All right, let's crack right on with today's powerful episode. I really, really hope you enjoy it. This is episode 35 of Just Breathe with Patrick McEwen. Children with mouth breathing and sleep disorder breathing have 10 times the risk of learning difficulties, 10 times the risk. Yeah. So it's not just a fraction, you know, this is, and of course, it's not just related to, to mouth breathing kids. Think about like, I'll talk to an adult and they'll say to me, well, I never breathe through my mouth. But then if you ask them, well, do you wake up with a dry mouth in the morning? That's what you said in your introduction. Yeah. You know, if we, if we are sleeping with our mouth open, there is a period of six to eight hours where we have chronic mouth breathing. Yeah. And it's not that we switch to mouth breathing 100% of the time, but we're going from nose to mouth and nose to mouth, or maybe breathing through both. And it does lead to a lighter sleep, yeah. snoring, obstructive sleep apnea, insomnia, because mm -hmm. when we're breathing through the mouth, we typically breathe faster and harder, and we're more likely to arouse from sleep. Yeah, just astronomical results in terms of elevation yes. of health and elevation yeah. of focus and energy for a child. Um, and it's worth giving them that chance. Yeah, yeah. Just before oh. I just showed the tape because just because sometimes when it comes up in terms of children, mm. of course, parents are going to be concerned. Yeah. Um, but the tape that we talk about, especially for children, is yeah. my own tape. And I'm just mm -hmm. going to do a demonstration on it, Georgie. It's yeah. just the tape is. It's a, it's a support aid to help children nasal breed and it's, it's cotton and it's kinesio tape based. The glue mm. has been altered, it's, it's hypoallergenic. This is obviously the adult size. Yeah. Stretch it. Pop it on, yeah. And what it does is there's an elastic tension mm. bringing the lips together and the tension is going from, from left to right, but it's also stimulating the muscle surrounding the mouth, the orbicular source muscle. So it's helping to activate it. Yeah. And we use this as a training tool, for, especially for children aged, say, four upwards. Yeah. You know, because during wakefulness, while they're watching television or if they're distracted or if they're doing homework, it's very important that when children are distracted that they breathe through the nose with the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. But yet, between 25 to 50% of study children persistently mouth breathe. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any child is going to thrive unless they have nasal breathing habit. 100%. And, you know, even taking the science out of it, you can see, right? I, I did an interview with a dentist and he was saying, when I see children with their mouths hanging open, their head falls forward, they yes. look disengaged with the world. Yeah. And yes. they, they look almost like unhappy children, yes. very unstimulated children. When they close the mouth, the head comes back, the posture comes up, they can actually see and experience the world yes. again. You yeah. said there's nothing more pleasurable for him to see as a dentist 
than these children they look brighter they look engaged yes. they yes. they're more curious as children should be yeah well by closing their mouths it's wonderful to hear that and i think that the future of dentistry is more than just looking into and fixing teeth yeah. It is really, they have got a tremendous role to play in terms of gatekeepers to the airway. Mm. They can identify risk factors in children. And as you said, forward head posture can be a compensatory mechanism or a compensatory um, you know, aspect in terms of children who are mouth breathing. I live stuck in my head for 20 years, yeah. completely absorbed and taught. And when you are living in your head, you miss out on life because you're not connecting with life. You're not relating to life through your senses. You know, if we have all of our attention absorbed and taught, we are absolutely asleep. And spiritually, throughout the centuries, always those words were tended to be used, mm -hmm. asleep or awake. You know, and really what we're talking about here is awareness. And what is it? You know, because these terms are always bandied around and mindfulness as well. And like, essentially all it means is that Number one is that we are paying attention to what we are thinking about, that we are aware of our thought processes. Yeah. And when we are on that cycle of often repetitive and unproductive and, you know, kind of incessant thinking, yeah. that we're aware of our thoughts and we're aware of the effect it's having on our emotions and how that's feeding back into our thoughts. And when we are aware of it, we can make a conscious decision to step out of thought not the easiest thing to do granted but at least the mechanism you know to be aware of it is is a tremendous step forward because for 20 years i was living absolutely encapsulated and taught lost in thought yeah you school, i wouldn't even you know if i picked up a book and as i said this in many podcasts i'd be looking at the page but my attention wasn't on the page mm -hmm. because i was so caught in my head yeah and yeah and the breath was a great it was a great gateway it was a great opener yeah to taking my attention out of the mind onto our breathing and you know like mindfulness it's a confusing term it really should be would be called stillness of the mind or presence yeah. or space awareness between thoughts awareness yeah. you know because that that and psychologists have estimated we have between 70 and 90 thousand thoughts a day and 95% of them are repetitive and useless. Like we are trained how to think, but we are not trained how to bring some space between our thinking and overthinking. It doesn't generate happiness. It's contributing to anxiety, to high stress and to, to unhappiness. Mm -hmm. And a hundred percent with people my age as well, the younger generation with things like social media, um, as brilliant yes. as it is for spreading awareness, it has such brilliant qualities, but everything is instant now, you know, you can get food instantly delivered to your home. You can yes. pay in an instant all the time, ding, 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 ding. And I say to, um, people I, I teach when I'm working with breath work, you know, that if your phone is on and it's in your room, the rest of the world is still in your room and you yes. haven't switched off and breathing yes. allows you, like you said, to create that space. And yes. which, which is why I am so passionate and about spreading this work. I think it's so important, especially to almost, I'd go as far as to save the young generation. Yes. To give them space. Yes. I think it's very sinister. You know, we, they're, they're multinational corporations and this is going to be broadcast on their platform and that's fine. You, you have a, a large multinational corporation who brings in expert psych, minds in psychology. And their one goal was, how can we make people addicted to our platform? Yeah. There was nothing about advancement in, in human potential. It's not about advancement in human potential. No. It's about these multinational companies. It's about them trapping us, trapping the younger generation and holding, holding them to the platform because the longer that they can have the person on their platform, the more money it generates and the more profit they make. They are Fueling the most- addiction. Almost. It is addictive. It is, and there's no question, the like buttons, yeah. all of this stuff, you know, on Instagram, if you send a message and if you don't reply, the message is, you know, all it's deleted and it's all time. It's so clever. Yeah. I really find it's terrible. I absolutely, yeah. my own child of a 10 year old and young girls, their suicide rates 
their suicide rates have increased dramatically since 2009. And people could say, well, well, it's how can you show that there's a causal relationship there? I think the science has shown it. Because if I look at Instagram, I'm nearly 50, so I don't care in terms of looks all that much. Genuinely, you know, it's, when you're in your 20s, it's always a, well, when you're in your teens, you're a little bit more insecure, of course, mm -hmm. naturally. But even the 20s can be insecure as well, you yeah. know. And for people who are, are attractive, you know, they're fine and, you know, life can be a little bit easier. And people who are normal looking individuals, they're looking, instant, looking onto Instagram and they're seeing beautiful bodies and beautiful faces and they're comparing themselves. And then there's a comparison, oh, I'm, I'm inferior because I don't look the same as that pe person here. But we have to bear in mind the people who are posting most about their own faces and bodies on Instagram are ones that have good bodies and faces. A hundred percent. And you know, I have uh, had a fair bit of experience in the modeling industry as well and know from experience that the majority of those beautiful photos are actually not a clear representation of the beautiful people posting them. Yes, they may be attractive individuals, but those photos are highly edited. Often yes. there are apps now where, you know, you can even make yourself smaller. You can completely airbrush your skin and it's creating unattainable goals for young yes. girls. I'm, I'm the same. Yes. I have a little sister in her teens and it is terrifying to yeah. think that now that is put out there as the standard and yes. there is no standard. It's yes. unattainable and yeah. it is not even a healthy standard because if you are five foot and yes. a little bit more of a pear shape, yeah, you're yeah. not going to look like the six foot one girl who is yes. a natural hourglass and has small bones. But why yeah. are we being constantly fed these images that that is um, acceptance? That's how well, there, so it's not a preference. It's a preference of a select group of individuals. So it is a preference of fashion designers and, you know, they're approaching it from their perspective. But yet that has been created as the norm. Yeah. And I don't know how to police this. And I don't know how to, as a parent, you know, like I don't want to be badgering my own child all the time. And I'm sure no. many parents don't. But this is where the education system could step in. And this is where they are likely failing. You know, cut out one or two subjects. Cut out geography, for example, or half geography, half the time spent on learning geography. It's an important subject, fine. And spend the other half about how to deal, how, how to protect yourself and exploring and getting so children know and teenagers know that what they are seeing is not a perception of reality. It's not the truth. It's a very distorted perspective. Yeah. And, you know, I think this is really, really important because, yeah. you know, opinions and all of the layers of conditioning that we've experienced throughout our, our, our lives, we are hypnotized. We are all programmed. Yeah, you've been brought up in the United Kingdom, I'm assuming. I've been yeah. brought up here in Ireland. I will be hypnotized differently than you will be. Mm. If somebody is brought up in a Muslim religion, they will be hypnotized differently than I am. And we all believe our own program to be correct we all believe that our own opinions are correct but yet our opinions are all so different based on how well we have been hypnotized yeah and we have been brainwashed mm. and you know this is the reality and people you know it's not that the it's it's just the reality there are layers of conditioning there so it comes back to this how can we take the opinions of others as absolute fact because everybody is approaching and making their opinion based on their conditioning yeah. and their conditioning is so different depending on their religion, depending on their education, depending on their peers, their family, what they view on television, etc. Yeah. So the truth, what is the truth? Yeah, but I think that links back round now to breathing to if if you look into yes. Dan Brule's work into Philip Shepard um, works a lot with embodiment work or all those different very well known practitioners in the world of breathing that you know their whole practice is in creating space like we were saying before coming back to self understanding yes. becoming aware of your own inner being because if you have more awareness of your own mind of your own perhaps destructive thought patterns that social media creates by breathing and coming back to breath and 
having yes. a better knowledge, right? You come yes. back to yourself in that space. So I go as far to suggest, why not switch that half a geography class with a 30 minute breathing session for children? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've seen it in my own life and we're all going to have ups and downs. We're all going to experience, you know, we're going to experience debt. You know, we're, we're going to experience what life does. Mm. And I have to say, when we have some constant and one constant in our life is the breath. Yeah. And life is very much softer. But not only is life softer, when something does go wrong, it doesn't seem to take us captive as much. Yeah. You know, we have that break there that we have some attention in the in the, in the body some attention on the breath that we are not just living in our head and if you think about it imagine there's two people and one person is very you know racing mind mm. and the other person has a calm mind and if i present a difficult situation to both people the person with the racing mind is probably going to go off the charts meltdown and the person with the calm mind they are in a situation that their mind is calm during their normal every day, that when something happens, they can approach it from a clear perspective. I was the one with the racing mind. Yeah. We can train the mind. Mm. You know, we can train the brain. We can train the brain. And the breath, as you said, is the one thing that's, that's really, really crucial here. And then if we start practicing breathing through the nose with the tongue and the roof of the mouth, breathing low with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs, that also has a calming effect on the brain because the diaphragm is linked with the emotions. Mm -hmm. And if we go one step further to resonance frequency breathing or cadence breathing to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute, it stimulates the vagus nerve. It increases what's called heart rate variability, which is a clinical measure of stress. Mm -hmm. And it is known that individuals with depression and individuals with trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, mm -hmm. They have reduced heart rate variability, but we can improve that by changing breathing patterns. So we can influence the functions of the body that's normally outside of our control through the breath. But I think there has been misinformation has crept in yeah. about the usefulness of big breathing, the usefulness of, you know, taking these fuller and bigger breaths and the and more take air a deep you breath, breathe. Right. Before you go into breath. your exam, take yes. a deep breath and everyone yeah. goes, <sighs> Yes, I did it. Yeah. And I didn't just take a deep breath for one breath, which might have been too bad. I took a breath. I took deep breathing. I went for a walk before going into one of my finals, third year or fourth year. Fourth year it was. And I went for a walk for about five minutes, hyperventilating for the five minutes. And I walked into the exam hall. I was absolutely out of my head. Yeah. I was totally lightheaded. And, you know, this is based on the idea that I thought it was useful to, like I was already a chronic overbreeder anyway. Yeah. You know, if you're already a chronic overbreather, if you're already stuck in sympathetic activation, it doesn't yeah. make sense to start. I should have been doing the opposite. Yeah. You know, I should have been yeah. sitting down, taking my attention inwards and really slowing down my breath to the point of nothing. Yeah. And that would have to bring me into a state of calm. And after that, then if I'm too, too relaxed and I need to be more alert going into the exam, do a few breath holds. But, you know, to increase blood flow to the brain, to increase yeah. CO2 or carbon dioxide, these are, see, this is the thing about breathing. We can alter our states and mm -hmm. we can downregulate or we can upregulate. We can achieve a better balance because the human being, we're always, the human body is always striving for balance. Like yeah. it, there's a tremendous intelligence going on in the human body. Yeah. And a balance that we're not, we don't want to be switched on all the time, but we don't want to be switched off all the time. We want to be in that balance that we can adapt to whatever situation arises. Exactly. And that's called resilience. Exactly. And, you know, it's for some people, they, they have pretty good resilience, mm. but, but others don't. And, yeah. you know, that's where, that's where the breath can come in. Yeah. yeah.